Let's start. <laughs> Hello. Sorry about that. There is a preamble <laughs> for our keynote today. Uh, <laughs> I'm Lisa Cohn. Luckily, uh, in my coaching and consulting practice, we talk about being authentic and being real and being human. Um, and so with that in mind, I want to say that uh, yesterday I was with my family at my, the bedside of my father-in-law, holding him as he passed. So I thank you in advance for your grace if I cry today or if I don't make any sense. Mom and Dad, this one's for you. <sighs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for supporting the amazing Women's Resource Center. I only wish we were in person because for those of you who don't know me, I am a hugger. In fact, I have socks that I call my COVID socks. They say, watch out, I'll blank and hug you. I am thrilled to be here today to represent the Women's Resource Center. And I'm also thrilled to share with you a bit about my path and my path to wholeness. I hope in it you find a map or GPS for your path to your own wholeness. I hope that my five important truths and four things I absolutely know, which I share with my clients and I'll share with you later, inspire you as truths or guide you to your own truths and what you absolutely know. I have learned that the path to freedom and wholeness can sometimes, can often be a tough path because we have to unlearn much of what we've been taught and point ourselves in new directions. But I have also found that it is without a doubt a magnificent path because for me, it is a path of love, deep, deep love. In fact, my older child once thanked me for teaching them a few things, including this. We're out here to be ridiculous, to hold things with complexity, accountability, and grace, and to love deep. I love deep. And I've learned to love even more deeply on my path to wholeness. To begin, I describe my childhood like this. The best seats I ever had at Madison Square Garden were at my mother's wedding, and the best cocaine I ever had was from my father's friend, the judge. For those of you who are not old enough to understand the wedding reference, my mom got married along with 2,074 other couples on July 1st, 1982 at Madison Square Garden, the huge indoor sports and concert arena in New York City. Back then, the garden seating was like a rainbow with red seats on the floor, then orange, then yellow, then green, then blue in the rafters. When my mom got married, I had red seats. Only time, what a waste. The wedding was presided over by Reverend and Mrs. Sun Myung Moon because I was a Moonie. I grew up in the Unification Church, the cult of all cults in the American age of cults. On the other hand, while I pledged my life to Reverend Moon as my Messiah, I lived with my dad, Danny. Yep, I said Danny. When I was young, I called my parents Mimi and Danny their names. To this day, I still call my dad Danny. I am a person, he says, not a position. If you call me father, I'll call you daughter. If you call me daddy, I'll call you daddy. Call me by my name. I lived with Danny and he lived a life of sex, drugs, and squalor in New York City's East Village in the 1970s. When I once said, well, maybe not squalor, during a presentation, my high school friends quickly corrected me and insisted it was squalor. They should know. They stayed there a lot. And yes, in my early 20s, I did a lot of cocaine with Danny and with his friend who really was a judge of a small town in New Jersey. During a book talk when To the Moon and Back was first published, my high school boyfriend quietly acknowledged from the back of the room, yeah, it was really good cocaine. Those are the two contrasting worlds of my childhood. My parents met in high school. My mom got pregnant. They got married and had my brother, Robbie. Then they had me. And then they separated three years later. Robbie and I lived with my mom in a basement apartment in East Orange, New Jersey. Every time she went down the hall to the laundry room, I would stand in the doorway sobbing, certain that she wouldn't come back, that she would leave too. When she went into the bathroom, I sat on the floor outside waiting for her. My world revolved around her. I could not let her out of my sight. My parents were hippies in all that entails. 
We were hippie kids, and I was terrified. I so wanted normalcy and rules. I wouldn't even cross the street on a red light and ended up lost alone in Greenwich Village one Saturday morning when I refused to cross and Robbie refused to wait for me. There was a lot of drugs. Danny dealt pot, and he had Robbie smoking pot by the time Robbie was 10. Danny and his various girlfriends walked around naked in front of us. My mom had abusive boyfriends and experimented with encounter groups, primal screaming, no talking days, and a macrobiotic diet, which is mostly brown rice, seaweed, and beans. I don't recommend it. Apparently, when I was in second grade, the school counselor called my mom because all of my writing was about food. The counselor was afraid I suffered from malnutrition. The summer between second and third grade, my mom bought a van from Danny. We were going to drive cross country to California to move on to the commune where my mom spent every summer. Unfortunately, though, my mom's mom was diagnosed with cancer, so we instead drove cross state to Milburn and moved in with my grandparents. My grandmother passed, and we stayed with my grandfather. My mom kept house for him, and he supported us. In January 1974, my mom's friend, with whom she used to hitchhike cross country to her commune every summer, called her to tell her that she had to go hear Reverend Moon speak. My mom went to the speech and came back a changed person, enthralled with what she had heard and all that Moon said. But not much, ha not much happened until the summer, when church members convinced my mom to spend a weekend in Barrytown, New York, where there was a huge church indoctrination center. My mom went up for the weekend and came back, and turned around and went back up for a week and came back, and turned around again and headed back up to Barrytown. Basically, she spent nearly the entire summer there. One weekend, we finally convinced her to take us with her. I will always remember pulling up to the huge brick building, heading into the gymnasium, where all the sisters, the women, were sitting on the floor on the right side of the room, and all the brothers, the men, were sitting on the floor on the left side of the room. Within moments, Moon walked in with his interpreter and began speaking. And that was it. We were in. What I tried to explain to people is that joining the church was, in many ways, a haven for Robbie and me. There was more structure. There were rules which I loved. My mom stopped cursing and started wearing a bra. There were hundreds of family members, Moonies, who doted on the two of us. And having a Messiah is actually incredibly intoxicating. It is the best drug ever. Life went on with the three of us living in Milburn with my grandfather and heading to the church center on weekends. Then my mom started going into the center a few days during the week, then a few more. She started taking the first train in in the morning and the last train home at night. Then she started staying over some nights. Finally, in January 1975, about six months after my first trip to Barrytown, my mom sat robbing me down and told us that she felt called to be more involved in the church, to serve God and our true parents, Reverend and Mrs. Moon. She asked what we thought she should do, and we told her to leave, to move into the church. It was clearly what God wanted, and my greatest fear, that my mom would leave too. We were 11 and 12 at the time. My mom moved out, ironically, to help run the group in the church for members who had children and couldn't move in. And even more ironically, she spent most of her time in the church caring for other people's children. To this day, I meet people who tell me how well she raised them and how much she loved them. My mom moved out, and with that, everything became my responsibility. I kept house for my grandfather and Robbie, handling all the shopping, the cooking, the cleaning, while also starring in the school play, I was Sarah in Guys and Dolls, and doing so well academically that my sixth grade teacher made up a new grade for me, A-W-D, A with distinction, because I'd gotten too many A++ pluses already. This went on for a while, and at the same time, unbeknownst to us, my grandfather was falling apart. 
He was a lawyer and a judge, and when my grandmother passed, he became depressed and let some of his clients' cases drop. When my mom left, he became even more depressed and let even more of his client work lapse. Then he was disbarred for how much he had let drop and lapse. And apparently the police would circle our block on a suicide watch for him. Finally, he was supposed to go to court and potentially to jail. And instead, his doctor admitted him to the psychiatric ward of our local hospital. Robbie and I were pulled out of school and shuffled around to stay with various of my grandfather's friends for a few weeks. Someone went to get my mom, who was now living at a church center in Queens, New York. She said, not my problem, and refused to come home. Eventually, somehow, Danny found out what was going on. When my mom left, we'd known not to tell him or anyone. He came and got us moving us into New York City to live with them in the East Village. I like to say before it was cool, back when it was only seedy. Living with Danny was scary and unsettling. His best friend smuggled cocaine up from South America. He used to, jokingly, offer to sell me to one of his friends for cocaine. His rage was explosive at times. We did have some rules. He did tell us that we couldn't shoot up smack on 2nd Avenue, where we lived. Smack would make us pass out, he explained, and if we were downstairs, we might pass out in traffic. It was okay to shoot up speed on 2nd Avenue, he said, because we'd be awake and, well, speeding. For smack, we had to come upstairs. I knew I was living with Satan, and I spent all my free time, weekends, summers, holidays, anything, at church centers and with church members. Even when my mom lived far away, back at Barrytown in upstate New York, or down in DC at Moon's God Bless America campaign at the Washington Monument, I was at church centers whenever I could be. I spent the summer between sophomore and junior year of high school in Seattle trying to bring in more members. It must have been so funny. I probably looked about 10 years old as I walked up to strangers outside the Space Needle engaging them in conversation and talking to them about God. I only ever wanted to be at the church and to serve God and my true parents. I always knew how unworthy I was and how little I could do. The summer between my junior and senior year, however, Danny sent me away to music camp. I'm convinced to this day to keep me away from the church. Again, I spent all my time there and he hated it. Plus, he never spent money on us. His money was for drugs and Baroque recorders. At music camp, I became friends with people who were, for the first time known to me, gay and or bisexual. This was a huge sin in my puritanical cult. I wrote to my mom, asking her what I should do. She replied, they're sinful and evil. You can convert them or just stay away from them. For the first time, her guidance Church guidance didn't seem right to me. I loved my friends and I knew they were good people, so I couldn't just listen to my mom. But you have to understand that we were literally taught that if we ever questioned anything, it was Satan inside of us trying to win us back from God. We were told that our questioning and disobeying would break God's heart. That God's heart had been broken by my, mankind for 6,000 years and that we would break it further. But for the first time, I didn't agree. And so I knew that Satan was in me. Now, I wasn't just a devoted Mooney. I was also best friends with Moon's second oldest daughter. Moon's children were called the true children because they were children of the Messiah. They were as holy and special as one could be. Then there were blessed children, children born to the church members who were blessed by Moon in those mass weddings. They were born without original sin. So they were pretty special too. And then there was me, sinful, tainted, ungodly me. I was friends with the true children and with some of the blessed children. But when I came home from music camp, I found out that Moon had decreed that only blessed children could play with the true children. I was no longer allowed near his daughter. I found out years later what had happened. One of my 16-year-old blessed children friends had been seduced 
by our Sunday school teacher. And in order to keep anyone from noticing, she told everyone that I wanted to have sex with all the brothers. Moon heard these rumors, believed these rumors, and made the decree to keep me away. I like to say, my Messiah banished me. I went into my senior year of high school knowing that I was invaded by Satan because I was questioning, and also knowing that the Messiah had banished me, so he also must have known that I was invaded by Satan. With this confusion and shame coursing through me, I decided that I had followed my mother into the church as a child, as a 10-year-old, and that I now had to pull back a bit to see life on the outside so that I could make a full adult decision at the age of 17 to go back and never question again. I started staying home on the weekends with Danny to his delight. I got closer to my friends in high school, something I had never allowed myself to do. And I found myself even more confused and questioning because I found more unconditional love and support and fun on the outside than I had found in my puritanical cult, which was supposedly all about love. Senior year continued, and I continued to experiment, including experimenting with alcohol. That spring, 40 years ago in April 1981, to be exact, I threw a surprise birthday party for my best friend, had way too much to drink at the party, and when a boy kissed me, I kissed him back. I now had a boyfriend, the hugest sin in my puritanical cult, the cause of the fall of man, to be exact, but fun and tempting. But isn't Satan always tempting? All hell broke loose, as church members found out. I was stopped on street corners and taken out for coffee and a lecture. My mom first locked me up in a room in the New Yorker hotel to scream at me, and then took me back to Barrytown hoping that that would remind me of the sinful path that I was currently on and all I had to lose. The summer continued. The torment continued. I'd be walking with Adam through Little Italy, holding hands, and I'd see someone in the distance with a bucket of flowers to sell. I'd drop his hand and maybe cross to the other side of the street. Or we'd be hanging out or fooling around, and I'd be washed over with disgust and shame and guilt and I'd pull away and into myself. The summer ended and I went off to Cornell in upstate New York while Adam stayed in the city at NYU. I determined that I had to and would break up with him once again, pledging myself and my life to God and my Messiah. Only I didn't and the torment continued. Again, I was at Cornell, a campus built between the Fall Creek Gorge on one side and the Cascadilla Gorge on the other, a campus where everyone joked about people jumping off the bridges. Then one afternoon, early in my first semester, I was walking home from an off-campus job, crossing the bridge over the Fall Creek Gorge, and I stopped, unable to continue. I stood there for, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes or so, wanting to jump desperately wanting to jump. I still knew Moon was the Messiah. I just didn't want to follow anymore. I therefore knew I was breaking God's heart, just like everyone since Adam and Eve fell from the Garden of Eden. I knew that dying was a better choice than leaving. I obviously didn't jump to this day. I don't, I'm not really certain how or why. I also didn't know how to actually leave the church and everything I knew as truth and everyone I knew and loved. I'd spend countless hours with a dear friend over and over crying, but what if it's right? But what if it's right? To which he finally said late one night, what if it is right, but it's not right for you? For whatever reason, that was something I could cling to. I started to pull more and more away from the church. Robbie says I never actually left, I just slowly drifted. I started to say I used to be a Mooney. On the outside, I'm sure I looked fine, but on the inside, I knew I had let God and my true father down. My freshman year, there were those moments on the bridge. My sophomore year, I stopped eating, and my anorexia took me to about 40 pounds less than I am now. My junior year, I started doing a hell of a lot of cocaine, including with my dad and his friend, the judge. My senior year, I embarked on more and more dysfunctional and abusive relationships. 
Again, I looked fine, even good on the outside, but I knew how wrong and sinful I was, how much I deserved to die for what I'd done. Soon after college, I got engaged with someone who worked for and drank with Danny, and who was very, very mean when he drank. Someone pointed me in the direction of Al-Anon, the 12-step program for those of us with our arms clasped around the alcoholic. I crawled into my first meeting in a church on Amsterdam Avenue and 86th Street, thinking only one thing, tell me if he's an alcoholic. There's no way I would ever be with an alcoholic. Perhaps needless to say, I discovered that there are multiple reasons why I would be with an alcoholic. Danny drank and drugged pretty much every day. There is addiction all over his family. Oh, and I was raised in a cult. That first Wednesday night in an Al-Anon meeting began my journey toward healing and my path toward wholeness. But first I had to realize that there was something within me to heal, and then I had to want to do that for myself. When I first left the church, my only choice for survival, it seemed, was to ignore, deny, and repress all of it. To believe that my childhood was weird but not bad, and that I was fine. If I ever thought about God, I would immediately think about the God of my cult, and I would immediately know that I deserved to die for leaving the Messiah, abandoning God, and breaking God's heart. When one of my first therapists told me that in order to heal, I would have to integrate the church and my experiences into myself and my life, my first response was to curse at her, and then to adamantly proclaim that again, only by ignoring, denying, and repressing it, was I still alive and standing. But after Al-Anon, I became my story and my wounds and my dysfunction. Only my story, my wounds, and my dysfunction. I defined myself by my trauma, and when my best friend pointed out that I actually suffered from complex trauma, that became even more of a mantle I wore, sometimes proudly and sometimes dripping with shame. One of the weird things about trauma survivors, or at least about me, is that we have a seemingly endless internal battle. Part of me used to know fully that I was loathsome and damaged beyond repair from all that happened to and around me. And part of me used to chastise myself whenever I talked about my suffering. It wasn't that bad, I'd hear myself say to myself. Other people have it far, far worse. In fact, every now and then I would ask, I still ask my therapist, it was hard, right? My childhood was hard, right? While it is true that there are unfortunately way too many people whose childhoods were horrific, and horrifically more traumatic than mine, I am happy to say that I have lessened that battle in my head. I can usually own that it was tough. I have dulled the litany of don't complain, only be grateful, and if you're suffering, it's because you're sinful and you need and deserve to suffer that I was given as a child. When To the Moon and Back first came out and I was going to be on the Megyn Kelly show, back when there was a Megyn Kelly show, The producer who was interviewing me for the backstory asked if I thought I had been brainwashed. My answer was quick and simple. I didn't have a brain to be washed. I was too young. My brain was pickled and carved by my cult. That's how they keep people. I am clearly a survivor of trauma and I have clearly suffered some PTSD. And there are a few things I know about that. One is that while I would not wish trauma on anyone, those of us who have suffered or experienced hardship, when we can begin to get to the other side, almost always have a deeper appreciation for life and the simple things in life. We can and do find more joy. This is in fact what post-traumatic growth is. It is officially defined as positive psychological change experienced as a result of adversity and other challenges in order to rise to a higher level of functioning. In layperson's terms, or at least to me, it means learning, growing, and thriving after trauma as opposed to only being consumed, defined, and conquered by trauma. Another thing I know is that, for me, moving toward post-traumatic growth 
did entail owning and integrating everything that happened to me. I guess that early therapist was right. When I left the church, I pretty much lost everyone and everything I knew and loved. It was like there were these 10 formative years of my life that didn't actually happen. Just a big black hole. Now I have looked at all of it. I have been back to church properties, sneaking in at times, and I have reconnected with almost everyone in the book, including Moon's daughter. Nearly the first thing she said to me was, I'm sorry my father did that to us. On my path to wholeness, the most essential thing I have learned is that I must love myself first and most. We all must love ourselves first and most. Society teaches, my cult taught that that is wrong or narcissistic, but that's not true. Truth for me is that if we don't love ourselves, we can't love anyone else. And if we rely on others for the love we need as adults, we set them up to disappoint us. I've had to learn that self-care and self-love were good, not sinful. That selfishness to me is good and not sinful. To quote Audre Lorde, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. I've learned to actively love myself, to pause, to breathe, and to tell myself how much I love myself. To have patience with myself, to forgive myself, and to accept myself. I start each day with my hand on my heart and I say, good morning, spectacular, I love you, Lisa. I spend much of all days with my hand on my heart. I've learned to fill myself with a love that I used to think I didn't deserve or that I had to get from someone else. As I say to my clients, we all need to do this, really. In my maybe not so humble opinion, we all need to do this. Now one thing I have to call out is that there is personal trauma and then there is systemic trauma. Both are scarring and self-care and self-love do help with both. But as I share with my clients and especially my clients of color, systemic and generational trauma require even deeper levels of healing, both personally and societally. I am about to share with you my five important truths and four things I absolutely know, and I firmly know that they are powerful. But I also know that they are not enough to heal systemic societal trauma all by themselves. They can help strengthen all of us to move through this trauma and to love and fight for change. They can help us love ourselves more. And loving ourselves more is a huge part of what needs to happen. The five important new truths I discovered that strengthen self-love are, first, it's okay to feel. When my mom left, I was told I was lucky to sacrifice for God and to live without her. I knew that if and when I missed her, or if I was sad, I was sinful. I've had to learn to let myself be sad and to mourn. I have learned to feel my anger and to express my terror. I can tell you about the EMDR therapy sessions I had, when my therapist would only see me after five on a Friday when the building was empty, because I would scream for an hour. I had to let my emotions out. I had to learn to have emotions in order to be whole. Second, I don't have to listen to the lies in my head. I was literally given lies to believe when my brain was pickled and carved. Lies like Moon was the Messiah and I was sinful for missing my mom. Lies like it was my responsibility to save the world and I had to be perfect or I would break God's heart. I don't have to believe these lies anymore. I've learned to say, that's the cult talking, to call out the lies and misthinking in my brain. In fact, I've learned to give this line, without the cult part, to most of my coaching clients, to help them with the lies in their heads. Because we all pretty much have lies, different lies in our heads. And we get to not believe them anymore. This line allows us to see these lies for what they are. And when we can see them, we can make a choice to believe something different. We can be whole. Third, there is no such thing as perfection. And to really twist my thinking at the same time, this moment is perfect just as it is, and I am perfect just as I am, flaws and all. This also means that you are perfect just as you are, flaws and all. Now, I am such a recovering perfectionist that Robbie once told me that I even tried to do not perfect perfectly. He was right. 
but for a long time now my favorite word has been oops and I offer that to you. My new mantra is be me wholly, fully and completely, love with all my heart and let it rip. Fourth, I don't have to try so hard. Like many people I know, I have faulty guilt, shame and responsibility gauges that kick in way too quickly and easily. I like to say I have a mighty mouse complex and I still think I have to save the day. If you put something in front of me, I will do it and I will do it extremely well, AWD well, even if I drive myself into the ground in the process. These are all coping mechanisms I created and needed in order to survive. We all created coping mechanisms, no matter what it was that we were facing. My mechanisms saved my life back then and they kick in now because they still think they're saving my life but I don't actually need them or need to believe in them anymore. And you don't actually need yours anymore either. We now can thank our coping mechanisms for how they saved us and tell them that we're safe. We can, again, make choices not to believe them anymore and not to work so hard at everything, to let ourselves be whole. And fifth, it's okay to feel joy. Like many of us, I was taught to feel guilty about anything good. I used to know I was letting God down if I wasn't working or striving or suffering. I have learned that when we feel guilty, it probably actually means that we're doing something good for ourselves. That we can celebrate that guilt because it means we are taking care of ourselves and living joy. I now know that joy is my answer and it is mine to create. I've learned to look for the good and the beauty around me and anything and everything that will and anyone and everyone who will ease my heart and soar my spirit. For me, again, it all starts with my hand on my heart and my love for myself, with knowing that my life's purpose is to love with all my heart. And, and this is when I have to lovingly quiet the voices screaming in my head right now, because they know that what I am about to say is way too full of myself and wicked and they cannot believe I'm about to be so immoral in public with letting myself own my brilliance and magnificence. Because we are all brilliant and magnificent. In closing, building off my five important truths, there are four things that I absolutely know. One, Extremist situations exist. They are absolutely prevalent, unbelievably intoxicating. Again, there is no more powerful drug than knowing you have the truth and they are outrageously dangerous. And there are ways to stay out and get out of them. Two, for anyone who feels hopeless or damaged beyond repair, there is hope and you are not damaged. I realized that before To the Moon and Back was published, I still thought I was damaged from all that had happened. I'm not damaged. I have damage. I have scars. That is entirely different. Three, as a species, we are way too hard on ourselves. And again, we need a huge dose of self-love and self-compassion. And four, you are awesome, blank and awesome, just as you are. Trust me on this. Own your brilliance and your beauty and your flaws and your scars. Stand in your power and in your light. Just do you. Let yourself be whole. As Leonard Cohn sings, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Love yourself even or especially the cracks in you. Let the light in and let yourself find your path. Again, let yourself be loved and let yourself be whole. Thank you again for supporting the Women's Resource Center and thank you again for coming today. I would love to hear from any of you who would like to connect and I can't wait until I can hug many of you. In the meantime, hug and love yourselves dearly. Thank you very much.
So Lisa, I want to first say thank you um, for your, your courage, your authenticity, and, um, and your words of wisdom. Um, I, I've heard pieces of your story before. I'm still blown away when I hear it. And I think your journey to who you are today is, is truly an inspiration for all of us. And um, I look forward to continuing to learn from you. <laughs> Um, we are going to give everyone an opportunity to talk with Lisa um, through a link that will distrib be distributed to you and you'll have the opportunity to talk more with Lisa, hear more about her journey and tap into her words of wisdom as well. So, And I want to thank all of you for, for joining us here today, for being a part of this, this experience, this event. Uh, WRC is only possible because of all the people like you who get involved in some way or another. Even today's event is a perfect example. We have a mainline uh, TV studio who has just generously provided some wonderful studio space for us here. Uh, Graham Media Partners actually did all of our social media communications for this event. And Anjali Gupta, from Pinwheel Provisions actually provided the delicious meals that you are about to have um, for your lunch today. So this is what it looks like at WRC. To top it all off, all of our sponsors today have been hugely generous in helping to ensure that this event would actually raise significant proceeds to fund WRC services. If you are here as a guest, and you would like to make a donation to our cause, you will receive a link in the chat and you're welcome to use that to make a donation. And um, we trust that you will be able to walk from here with the inspiration that Lisa has shared with us. I invite you to join, join Lisa via the Zoom link or to continue networking together. The, the networking room will stay open. And for those of you who purchase lunch, Please enjoy your lunch. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you to Lisa for your incredible courage and amazing story. And um, thank you to everyone here.